Daphne, hi, and welcome. Thank you for coming on today. Uh, it's so wonderful to have you. Thank you, Kevin. It's a treat to be here. All right, we'll take it. So uh, just can you take a second and uh, introduce yourself and, and tell us what you're all about? Uh, my name is Amy Patricic. I like to call myself a learning enthusiast because I am a learner of all of the things. Um, always learning is a big part of who I am and what I'm about. Um, I work as uh, a learning designer in the tech industry, and I also have a, a podcast called Share What You Learned, which is a learning design, instructional design podcast for people who want to learn a little bit more about our field and or looking to upskill as well. So highly recommend. Come check us out and listen to some of our conversations. Yes. And actually, that's the reason that I reached out from, out to you because I listened to a lot of your conversations. I saw the, the kind of took a browse through some of the, the work that you have done. And you've had the opportunity to speak to different folk from all over different learning industries, representing different pieces. What are some of the big things that stuck out or, or what are, are some of the big trends that you found from talking to all these different folks? So what, what kind of trends are you seeing at the moment? What's big for you? In terms of trends, I would say one of the big thing that's surfacing is accessibility and learning. When I look at my uh, podcast episodes, um, there's one in particular that I did with Erica Zimmer early on. I want to say maybe it's episode three, um, talking about accessibility and learning. That episode is leaps and bounds above every other episode I've ever produced um, in terms of listens and downloads. Um, and so that for me just speaks volumes as to like, this is something that's really important in the industry right now. Um, and if you're on LinkedIn at all, I feel like that's something I see weekly, maybe even daily is like, how can we continue to make our content more accessible to a variety of learners? And then maybe one of my takeaways from uh, doing an entire season of a podcast is while there is this phrase, instructional design, learning design, learning experience design, it really looks different at every company. No matter, each company has different focal points in terms of what they want their designer to be focusing on. It could be accessibility, it could be VR, it could be uh, rapid content creation, it could be um, I mean, job aids being a huge part of the job. And so you know, when I was new to the industry, I had this kind of assumption that that term was kind of universal and meant the same thing across a variety of um, industries and or uh, actual employers. When in fact, this is where I would just advocate to anyone pursuing work in the field is really do your due diligence to see what matters to that company. Um, sometimes that's really evident in job descriptions, and sometimes it's more so evident um, through the interview process. But just really do your due diligence because whatever your skill set is, there is a place, a business looking for that skill set and prioritizing those companies, I think will really make you a more happy and fulfilled employee. So anyhow, in terms of like industry trends, I would say accessibility. And then just like one of the broader things I've learned is I'm basically having conversations with different people who work at different companies but generally I'll have the same job title and get to do really unique or different things um, within the title or umbrella of instructional design. There's a lot of transitioning teachers that are getting into the workforce right now, or some folks who are getting training around building those courses, but where do you suggest somebody get started when analyzing different job descriptions or knowing that they'll have to prepare the, the whole range of interventions when uh, coming into a company for instructional design? I, for me, a huge part of any job I've taken that I've thoroughly enjoyed and felt like was a great fit for me always involved solid networking. And so I am a huge advocate of like, just start talking to people. I know that when I was trying to break into the corporate world, one of the things I did was talk to people and say, these are the things I love about instructional design. Do you know companies that... Um, that this is their bread and butter, what they do. Um, and then they would say, oh, this company, that company, and then try to connect with people at that company to say, I heard this is something that's really important to your company and a facet that that you guys just live and breathe. Can you tell me a little bit about what that looks like in the day to day? So talking to people was really pivotal for me to understand where I was going to thoroughly enjoy my work and where yeah. the work was going to be. Um, feel most valuable to me. So, you know, if you're someone who's like, 
you know, I'm, uh, some larger companies will have more intricate, um, learning teams. And so for instance, maybe you really don't love the analysis portion. And so maybe there's a consultant who sits on that team. I mean, that's a job title that's out there learning consultant and, uh, historically how I've, how I've experienced those roles. It's like, they do a lot of the analysis for you. And then they package the analysis and send it off to you. And now you just get to do for referencing Addy, the design and the delivery component, um, which for some people is like, awesome. I get to not do the analysis part, but I get to do the design delivery. That's what I love to do. But you only know that in my opinion, I think a job description can only tell you so much. Yeah. So absolutely use it, but also like talk to people. I think people, people know businesses best and also, um, can kind of help steer you a little bit more than just going out on LinkedIn and reading job descriptions. You're probably, unless you're going to be the first hire on a team, you're probably not going to be engaged in the full process on your own from start to finish. And yeah. I know that when I first started out, I was not trusted to do an analysis, which was uh, a relief for everyone. It was more focused yeah. on, and yet we actually just need you to build the thing. Here is the specs. Mm -hmm. Here's your audience. Here's your, the summary. We need you to build an experience that we can test. So that was very much my experience. And and also to your other point, I, I had no idea what an instructional designer was. And it's hard to wrap your head around any part of the industry. Are you going to be doing just rote training? Are you going to be designing a, a VR story uh, tra a, a VR storytelling experience? So um, I think it's it's such good advice to get fine folks in your network and just reached out on LinkedIn. After all, that's how I got in touch with you as well. So uh, yeah, it's, it's it works. It does work. It does work because here we are. Um, you The other thing that you mentioned as far as a big trend is accessibility. Why, why is accessibility so big right now? Or why are people trying to figure it out? I have some assumptions that I think pre-pandemic, I think a lot of our training and development happened more so tended to be face-to-face. -face. There was a little bit more Maybe I would use the word opportunity for accessibility because you can visually see like, oh, this person needs support in this way. Sometimes there are those visual cues that really help um, the trainer at the front of the room to be like, okay, this is this is where I need to step in and support or create additional options. Um, I also think just like the, the physical nature of setting up a room just accommodates a little bit more to like, you know, if you have people with physical limitations a lot of times the buildings are already built that way to like mm -hmm. support people entering the training room and so there are just some things we didn't have to think about i think there are plenty of things to think about still not saying we didn't have to think about anything yeah. um i think when the pandemic happened so much of our training transitioned to asynchronous online learning and if you're looking at a very um I want to use the words like basic online learning, one that has little thought or creativity put into it. I think it can kind of mirror that of a website um, mm. in terms of like just lots of text, your random picture, and you're like, this is on the internet. This is what the internet looks like. People find a way to figure it out. And you, you don't have that contact with your learners. You can't see them with your eyes to know how that's impacting people. Um, I also think there's this um, upskilling that's happening currently of what do people need to leverage learning on the internet? Um, is it like, like for myself even, I installed a um, speech to text uh, app on Chrome. It's free, you can go out there and find them. I installed that so that way when I was going to publish an e-learning, I could hit this uh, text to speech and have it read to me the page. And then I'm getting that experience in the same way that someone's leveraging a speech to text software is going to use. And I can experience some of those hiccups and be like, oh, this is how that user's experiencing it. I need to, this alt text doesn't make sense that I put in there. It doesn't, it doesn't flow in the way that I'd hope. Like, let me go back and redo that. Um, it takes, takes a little bit more intentionality and thought to think about the broad landscape of people who are going to be accessing an online asynchronous course. And I think a lot of times we think transcripts, subtitles, alt text, 
all important things, but there are other factors to consider that, that, tr you know, like that truly make, I'll finish the sentence first, that truly make learning more accessible, you know, like contrasting colors or, or text, um, uh, even sometimes like fonts we're choosing, um, images and how they appear um, to people with some visual limitations, like all of those kinds of things that asynchronous learning requires us to be more intentional, to slow down and think when it's so easy to just pump text out, hit publish, and like, yeah. ta-da, I made a course. Exactly. Maybe five years ago when I was making um, online learning products, it was enough at the time to publish a course. It had uh, video images and, and text, and it was hosted out on an LMS. You could conceivably publish this course and meet ADA guidelines. You could put your uh, put subtitles on it, alt text, and you could call it a day. And uh, at the time, I admit I could feel pretty good about it. But mm -hmm. now, as accessibility has become more important, it's not just something that I'm adding on at the end, but almost thinking about accessibility throughout every point of the cycle. And I think accessibility is and and localizations, all of those things. I think those are things we'll always be learning about. I don't think there will come a day where we'll wake up and be like, ah, we have it all figured out. And so I think what I would challenge or offer to other designers is start, I would, I would use the analogy of like putting on the glasses. So like put on the glasses you have today that help you understand diverse groups of learners and their need, but be willing to like swap those glasses out for new ones as you continue to gain more awareness more tools, more resources to continue to support your learner. So, you know, this um, there can be like a an, uh, with analysis paralysis, I think is the term of like, there's so much to think about. I can't do anything. No, like you have tools and resources, like use what you have, but also don't be stuck there. Yes. Allow yourself to continue to add things to that toolkit. And when you get feedback that from my experience, it's been common that on a, on a course, like if you, you would put some kind of tagline of like, if, if additional accommodations are needed for this course, please reach out to da, 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 or there's an alias or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so take note of that feedback that you're getting and build with those learners in mind, like just could continue to allow yourself to learn, evolve and grow in that. Yeah. And then, and then just to, to add on to that a little bit, if you don't create something and get the feedback on it, you're never going to know if you hit the mark. How, how close or far you are from the mark. So to that point about analysis paralysis, create the course, work with what you have. And I like this analogy of taking on and off glasses. Keep those glasses on until you, maybe until you finish the thing and then it's time to swap out as you continue to add on. But the focus for our season one in progress is how can we use video better in learning? And so before I get into this, I do have my preamble, which is we know that video is a tool, uh, and I think it's one that I, I know that in my own past, it's one that I've used. It's kind of gone. Uh, I've always been co-designing with video in mind, whether that's, again, building uh, video products or thinking about how we record uh, live sessions or conversations and use those to teach people or help people learn um, with uh, on-demand video products and things like that. Also, it's an, I think it's important to acknowledge that learning has, in my head, has always been tied to video, thinking about laser discs back in high school where we're no longer taking a static textbook or turning, we have animations and things we want to show or we want to show stock footage. Um, we also have uh, that we're moving into online courses. Some of them are not so great. Like you said, they're just videos on a web page, but we do have e-learning as well. You have uh, YouTube videos where you have user created content and all these resources that people have access to. We have Zoom, we have VR, we have Loom videos that are used in performance support. So I would really argue that Yes, video is just a tool that we have, but it's a really, really important tool. Having said all that, uh, just because I've been, uh, I've been harangued out of a room before by instructional designers because I started off with that without justifying it. I mean, what was the last time that you used video in a learning experience? I would argue, I would argue that some of the best learning I've created has always included a video of some kind. And so when you're asked like, when have you used video? It's like most of the time I'm using mm -hmm. video. And I would say that because 
myself as a learner, if I, you know, for going back to those super basic low lift courses where they're just a bunch of text, a graphic here and there, I know what I personally do when I've been assigned to take a course like that. It looks like skimming and or looking for the bold highlighted words and then scroll, continue, scroll, continue, scroll, continue. I'm not engaged at all with, with the content. I also know in the rem- in the remote world, I'm making an assumption that a lot of people are remote employees or working from home now. Um, we're sitting on Zoom or whatever your video broadcasting company is, uh, watching people all day long. And so to sit and read a course, it feels tedious to me personally. Sometimes it just feels like the content could be great, but like, I don't have time to read. Um, and so what I love about a video, also side note, I live in a tiny apartment. So like my kitchen is five feet away. My living room is five feet away from me at all times, but that I can in a course put on a video and listen to the content while maybe preparing my lunch or mm. while, um, doing an exercise or something. I don't know. Um, But what I've really enjoyed and one of the reasons that I think um, videos should be so integral to our learnings these days is it allows the user to, one, continue to engage with um, the content, but two, not be locked down to their seat and their chair, which is, I feel like, where we are most of our days nowadays. We're locked down to our seat and our chair. And so if we can give them an opportunity to get some of that, like, kinesthetic men in while simultaneously watching a thing um, and learning or digesting something. I think that's just one, really kind to our learners. And two, I can speak from personal experience of when I've taken a course with video and it's allowed me that uh, I am a wiggler as well. So like just that space to like wiggle and move my body, I am actually digesting and know the content in a much more solidified way because I'm not required to sit here and continue to focus on a screen that I've been focusing on all day long. Um, So maybe like my roundabout way of answering that is like I try to put video in as much as possible. Interesting. It's something that you mentioned there that that I I do find fascinating you hadn't thought about was that if we're going to conduct a Zoom training over Zoom or some sort of video, um, uh, live video, it is a very... um, it is a very, uh, the word that comes to mind is selfish if I'm thinking from the perspective of a trainer because we're asking somebody to sit there and watch. But as you move things onto line, it does allow for more flexibility. And I love how you're talking about using two channels because I, I always think of video mostly as the visual channel, but of course, it's also the audio channel. You get to wiggle. You get to kind of conduct yourself how you are in your own personal space. You can wander off and, and continue listening. And if you miss something, you also have the option of, rewinding which is also a, a a newer behavior that we have or an affordance that video has where you can watch things over again if you didn't get at that time you can go back to that space do you remember what what was the first type of uh video learning you produced it was a technical training mm-hmm. what i loved about it though is that so the the video largely was walking through technical steps on something um that was important and necessary. Again, I think that has more value than sitting there and reading steps and, um, but watching someone actually interact and do the technical steps, I think has more value. But what I did was I bookend the technical screen recording with a uh, beyond video and I created basically a scenario. And uh, so this isn't the exact scenario, but like uh, basically a, created a scenario that one of my learners would actually interact with. So it's the actual like business case. And, and so beyond allows you to do the characters. And so having these characters on a screen, so it feels very real world, like, oh, this could just be me and my colleague talking about how we would solve this. Um, and then it cuts over to here's the technical skills to be able to do that thing that they're having trouble with. And then again, the bookend on the other side was another beyond segment. And so sent them back to the scenario and showed the outcome after applying the technical skills. Um, what I loved about that was just not only did was it, you know, more engaging because someone's watching the technical skills unfolding in front of them instead of just reading it on a screen, but then two created this like life around the technical skills 
which allowed the learner to feel like this is actually important to me. I need to follow along. And I'm going to tell you how I experience things as a learner. But if I open the video and I just see two people talking, I'm like, I, I don't even have to click play. And I'm just like, oh, this is just going to be like people talking. How boring. But if you see like animated characters on the screen, you're like, what's going to happen? It's like the, it's like the five-year-old and like the cartoons so of like, oh, we're watching like mom and dad are letting me watch a show this morning. How cool, you know, it's like the engagement drives up that much more because it's not real people on a screen. And eventually, you know, cut to that, but um, just leveraging that engagement and the enticement of like cartoons. <laughs> Adults love cartoons too. <laughs> yeah. I think what's interesting is you're also tying the story. That there's a storytelling aspect that you're mentioning where you're mm -hmm. kind of bookending, you're giving context to the technical skill and you're embedding it with something that is a real scenario or a real using animated character. Right. The scenario that, that people might conceivably run into at work where they get to experience, okay, here's the story of these two. Here's something that they can't do. Here's the technical skill training because character B wasn't able to get it. And then yeah. suddenly afterwards, you get to see that positive or ne I guess negative outcome if that's your, <laughs> if that's your intent as mm -hmm. well. When you're creating your training video, and I know that you are in technical, you're in technical skills training. Uh, I'm sure you do other types of training as well. <laughs> but what are, that, that seems to me like it could be very dry content. I think if you've watched any sort of Camtasia tutorial, you know that it could be step one, step two, step three, step four. So I guess what are what are five ways that that people could um, make that sort of technical skills training engaging? Technical skills is not my bread and butter these days, but I do have experience with that. Um, so I will say one thing that I think is an easy lift is voice or intonation in the audio recording. So a lot of times with technical training, there's an audio overlay that's saying like, click here, do this, pull up that. There's a very, we all know, like we've heard those trainings or those um, technical videos where um, it's very monotone and people are just click here, do this. There is an opportunity to say, to just in some small way, be like, click here, this will help you, da, 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 da. And just in like raising your intonation in that small way, you know, if I'm, if I am multitasking while watching this training video and I hear the intonation and the voice change, it's this just natural thing our body does to go, what's going on? <laughs> and you pay attention and look back at the screen. Um, and so I think that's one super small lift that people can do in videos, just alter their voice or create, if you ever talk to a voiceover actor, um, they talk about, you know, they might be doing a commercial for dog food or um, reading a book or something, but they'll tell you that they internally are thinking that they're a character and they have this like picture or image of a character that they're carrying throughout um, the audio that they're reciting. I would say the same as it's an opportunity for us as well in doing our technical trainings is like, could you take on internally just in your own brain a character and carry that character through just using your voice? It's just a fun and engaging one. It makes recording your audio way more fun. Um, but two is also a way to just get learners to look back at the screen a lot of times when our attention tends to drift in these um, tedious technical trainings. I think two would be uh, maybe this one's simple too. I think when it comes to technical trainings, a lot of times we do screen recordings and we just basically keep our whole computer screen up and are recording that and click here, do this, pull from this drop down. Um, I heard it said once that good video production, the screen is changing every four to six seconds. Um, I don't know if that's factual, if there's like statistics or data that stands behind that. Um, but I have found personally, that's one way to keep my attention. And so if we are doing technical training and you're looking at someone's screen, I would offer do things to the screen if possible, every four to six seconds, um, to create that engagement. So maybe you're zooming in to a particular dropdown and then zooming back out, or maybe you're putting like a text overlay, like don't forget, or I don't know what it would be, but something like that to create more than just 
I'm sitting here looking at someone's screen. Cool. Also, we can't see where are you clicking. Um, and so just in those small ways, creating visual, um, I would use the word like differentiation or yeah. engagement, maybe it's the more broader term, um, to help people continue to visually look at the screen. Um, I tend I tend to use the the term uh, jingling the keys. It's like you <laughs> always have to be jingling the keys somewhere on the screen, even if it's yeah. a shape in the in the very background, just slowly moving across the screen. You gotta have something to keep people moving because that's where mm -hmm. what we expect from video everywhere else. Three is not necessarily like something to do, but it's maybe like a lens to look through or a hat to wear, whatever analogy you want to use. It's like as you watch video in training on TV, on YouTube, like notice what distracts you from the video. So if, if there's like a banner going across the top of the video, is that distracting you? from what the person on the screen is trying to say and like take mental note of that and then don't do that in your videos and you could also say the opposite of that is like if there's something that like really drew you in like take note of that put that in your toolkit and feel free to use like that animation or that transition or um whatever in your video like i'll i'll even say um i don't use tiktok i'm not a big tiktoker but TikTok videos, I feel like, get fed into all these other social media platforms. As I watch these videos, I take note of like the transitions and the way that people are leveraging real, I would Instagram reels, maybe is the word that's stuck in my head, but they're TikTok videos. The way they're leveraging positioning, the way they're leveraging screen cuts, like all of those things. Like, yes, these are people out in the world, but those are video editing tips, tricks, and tools that we can carry in our back pocket and leverage in our learning, if this is enticing you out on TikTok, I would argue that online training is in competition with TikTok at times, you know? So like yeah. to keep engagement is what I'm referring to. And so what are ways that we can beg, borrow, and steal was a phrase one of my college professors yep. used to always use, but like beg, borrow, and steal what's happening out in society and culture and learn from that and leverage that in training. Amy, can I just jump in real quick because Yes, is something that that third tip that you said just really res resonated with me. Where I often think I, I'm I love watching movies, and one thing in particular that I love about movies is you're always your eye always knows where to look when you're watching a movie, um, whether that's the focal length of the of the lens or that's the way that uh, an opening title appears on screen. It doesn't appear all at once; maybe it appears in moments, but it's all with a purpose to focus your attention at every particular moment on the at a time. And so I, I bring a lot of that into instructional design where uh, I'm combining multimedia theory with uh, love of cinema. Maybe I'll try and make my videos a bit more, I don't, I wouldn't call them cinematic necessarily, but trying to borrow the, those techniques mm -hmm. of focusing on one thing at a time. That being said, because you brought it up, I'm, uh, I'm also not an avid TikToker, although it does make kids brand my need. <laughs> I also probably should be on TikTok. But, and uh, I, I do watch a lot of YouTube videos. I used it to learn how to use Premiere and how to explain concepts. And it's where it's just naturally my first place to go. But one, uh, one thing that maybe, and that you can identify it with this as well as somebody who's on LinkedIn and, other, and that social media platform is, the learning design community is not a big fan of, or at least the, I will see the OGs of the learning design community do not, uh, or at, or are, they really do not like, um, techniques borrowed from outside of Mayer's multimedia principles. And I see it time and time again, where it's, oh, I, I'm, of course, I'm not going to name names, but it's, we shouldn't have music on our on our training slides we shouldn't have quick cuts um if you you should not have a face and text on the screen at, at the same time and yet these are techniques that we've I, that i've seen in my own part of the learning sphere where com, you know if i'm looking at my metrics for completion they are higher or the hot there are less hot spots because people have consistently watched an experience that has been designed for them for the full way through and so i myself have had a, a lot of trouble balancing okay the instructional design community which i've been a part of for 
10 years is not, is seemingly at odds with my, um, my product experience, uh, as part of my world. And I'm wondering how do you, does this affect you? How do, how do you make sense of this? I think there are things to learn from both worlds. And I think there are things to take from both worlds. I think if, you know, you use the phrase like OG instructional designers, and I would say the other world is like um, cultural, I don't know if it's norms or kind of what's happening in society these days in terms of technology. I think what the OG instructional designers are really advocating for is thorough, well thought of, objective driven learning. And I wholeheartedly agree that's important. Um, as, and I would argue that like the thing, the societal cultural piece is bringing in is like, what's important to people today? What gets people's attention today in this world we live in? And so I think Amy Patricic's personal uh, opinion is that the best learning experiences is we're going to marry those. Let's let's marry like the science and the history and the um, intentional learning objective based with what's happening in society today and what's important to people today, being willing to evolve. And I think that kind of comes back to like knowing your learners and knowing what's important to them. And um, if we've all like taken taken a if we stay in that like that picture of whatever that old sexual harassment training is right? <laughs> it's like oh this is awful waste of my time like if we stay there we're not doing and we're not doing due diligence to our learners yeah. um and so knowing like what's important to them and what keeps them engaged and is important to us as designers and i will argue that like in this asynchronous world now i can have something up on my screen and I can have my phone in front of me with my TikTok, my Instagram, with the thing that's more engaging to me. And that's where I'm saying, like, I, I use, I'm going to say this phrase, and I both mean it and I don't mean it. It's like we're in competition with those things. And so how can you ensure that the learner's paying attention to you and not pulling up their phone and doing whatever notification is calling mm -hmm. to them? How can you be just as engaging so that, that notification goes off and they're like, I'll attend to that later because this has me sucked in right now. One of the reasons that I'm very, um, I'm very passionate about a, a, a good visual experience in my learning design is because of that engagement. Everywhere else, especially when it comes to video and learning experiences, everywhere else we consume video is either short form or colorful or more visually engaging than when you go into your traditional online learning and you watch a video and it's narrated slides on text that might be true to Mayer's multimedia theory to the T, but it is not as inter nearly as interesting. What is in a smaller form closer to my face that has everything else wh where I consume all my other, um, all the other content in my life. It's uh, difficult to, uh, then get me to concentrate on, on what's in front of me on the screen. Um, I'm, I'm also, uh, I, that also reminded me that a lot of, I feel like the, the good learning that I've consumed lately has been, uh, it's, I don't even think of it as learning anymore. It's more a continuation of things that I'm interested in and new facts that I've been introduced to. And over that experience, I then make sense of, uh, I then come away with, uh, a new mindset or new behaviors or, or something new. And. I think often when we t when I have talked to others about training in, in my part of the learning world, we're still differentiating between learning and then working. And there's much more of the uh, of the movement in the recent years towards learning in the flow of work, where it's I shouldn't even have to really uh, be pulled into something separate to continue to do my job. It's I sh this should relate to directly, I should be able to consume this and continue to do my job. So I guess what I'm trying to say in a, in a long way is that it's really about combining uh, learning with everything else that we do. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you're learning how to cook and you open up something on your iPad and you're watching that video and trying to follow the recipe, you're not thinking, oh, this is learning. This is you trying to do something in life as you're learning in real time and applying those concepts. So mm -hmm. 
Uh, it's very much everything else that you're doing with learning. It doesn't have to be mm -hmm. that separate experience. Yeah. From a very logistical standpoint, I think one of the like ways learning and development is being pushed, maybe I would say for the better and maybe in some ways for the worse is I would, I would say to get out of the LMS um, because the LMS is that I go someplace else to learn this thing. I a hundred percent think there's a place for that. And as we talk about learning in the flow of work, LMS isn't that for employees. And so, especially in the remote age, like, you know, I've heard people talk about conversations of like, how do I, how do I leverage my Slack platform to like get learners engaged or get them to know content? How do I, you know, if you have any kind of regular content being emailed to employees, if you're an internal, if you work with internal learners, like how can you leverage that? So basically they're not getting content from one platform, AKA the LMS, but they're getting it from maybe Slack, maybe from email, maybe from their intranet pages. Like, so it marries across all of these places. One thing that's really challenging for, um, in the learning and development field then is to really quantify or understand our impact because the beauty of an LMS is that it allows all of this tracking. And so once you take it out of an LMS, we're then no longer able or really struggle to report on um, the return on investment on some of our some of our work. And so again, 100% think there's a place for an LMS. And I think some of the challenge society the world is taking us to is learning in the flow of work sometimes means taking it out of the LMS. Okay, and how do we connect or draw back to um, return on investments for the company, for our work? How do we point to our work really making, having that value impact? So I, mean, I, just, I think a thing that's intention in the learning and development world is we talk about learning in the flow of work these days. Because you brought that up, I've, I've, this idea of leaving the LMS, but leaving our data and our uh, our business case for ROI behind, and then also what's what our learners are requesting, which is more of learning in the flow of work. I'm going to put you on the spot for our last question. How would you, in an ideal world, how would Amy Patricic put it all together? I, one of the things, well, the real answer is I don't have an answer, but here's some things I've thought about. <laughs> there are some LMS platforms that integrate well with Slack. And so if your company is one that's leveraging Slack, I would be really curious as to how or if your LMS integrates with Slack. And I say that because there are ways you can push content through the LMS via Slack, um, whether that be reminders, whether that be um, like infographics about courses, whether that be like you can you can populate if someone were to raise a question in a workflow in Slack and say like, oh, I'm looking for a question about this, that it could automatically then ping them with a course link in the LMS that would drive them back to the LMS so we can get those, um, uh, the tracking information, that kind of stuff, be able to report on it. Um, that would be one thing I think is, is important and um, valuable to, to learn about when and where and as you're able. Um, the other thing I would say is a lot of companies have um, intranets where they're housing a lot of, and this is again for internal um, facing, but um, where they're housing a lot of content specific to a particular, uh, whether it be like tech thing or sales thing or whatever, like the, all the content sits out there. Um, if If there's also a way for you to link to LMS content from that internal spot, instead of them being isolated, siloed, separate resources, how can we better integrate them? So when I'm building a course for internal users, a lot of times I'm linking from the course back to the internal intranet. But then once you're in the internal intranet, I'm also linking you back to the course. So it becomes the cycle of anyone who's looking for this content is likely, or this topic maybe, is likely going to hit the internal page, which is important and has valuable resources, but then also going to hit um, the LMS, which has training and resources to upskill or or help them in their job there. Um, 
So I would maybe like in summation, what I'm saying is like integration as much as possible and um, being aware of a user's click path. And so if someone's coming here, like let's, for example, talk about an internal um, intranet page. Personally, I would go through and click the links on that topic that the people, if I'm researching for like how to do the specific technical skill, I'm going to look at like what links are people clicking on. So I can pretend like I'm the learner, I'm the user and get that experience. And at what point and where do I want to plug in LMS content? Where is it, where is it important to integrate that? And so it's, it's kind of like doing your analysis or due diligence of like, where does content already live and how can you then integrate that with um, the LMS platform? I will also say like they're another component to like learning, um, creating good learning is I would also, I would use a terminology like it has a good communication plan attached to it. If people don't know this learning is out there, then we've just created it to go sit in an LMS. And so I think some of our, communication strategies around course um, development. I think there's opportunities to do things in really creative ways and link to an LMS as well. But it doesn't necessarily have to be this really formal. I think a lot of times people just think of the comms plan as like, oh, I enrolled the learner. So they got an email notifying them that they're enrolled. And I think there's like a way that we can craft a comms plan that exists outside of that, that maybe it's an email um, campaign from like a champion within the company who's really advocating for the importance of this learning. Maybe it's um, a Slack campaign where you're saying T minus X days till this course is released. Um, and there's like a really fun and engaging graphic as well. And um, be on the lookout for that prize email enrollment email coming your way on Monday, you know, like whatever the thing is, but I'm thinking of saying in a long winded way, integration as much as possible. And then also think about maybe where you can get creative in your comps plan around the course. Learning teams need to upskill in marketing because just like our, our videos and are, are a little bit outdated compared to everywhere else. So is our marketing and comps plan. And then in the long term, maybe even uh, we just need our own marketing team. We need to re rebrand learning and, and figure out how to get uh, get our content in front of eyeballs and really go to where our learners are at because we're asking them to do a lot to go to an LMS or go to this outside uh, platform and um, do something that is not where they are during their everyday. Um, Amy, I can't thank you for enough. I wish I had another hour with you. This was so fantastic. Thanks for uh, Thanks for taking the time to stop by. It was wonderful, Kevin. Thanks for asking me to come and uh, look forward to connecting going forward. Sounds good. Talk to you soon. All right.